Morning. My name's Thomas. I'm one of the pastor elders here at Turning Point Church. Love that old hymn, the old rugged cross. And you'll notice we have an old somewhat rugged cross. We, we hung it there in 2013 when we finished the building until we could figure out where it was supposed to go. <laughs> and it's still there. So <laughs> I guess that's where it goes. The old rugged cross. Uh, what a privilege to be here this morning. This is a blessing that we come together as a church, as a faith family, a forever family, and we get to worship together and lift our hands in praise and call on his name. It is just a great privilege and honor to be here together. And this, uh, this beautiful Northwest day. So I made a mistake first service, and I don't have to admit that, I imagine, uh, but you guys talk. Some of you first and second service people. Uh, so I, I announced, I was just talking about the weather in the beautiful Northwest day and praising God and being thankful for this day. And I just decided to share that Stacy and I were at the beach for a couple days off for our anniversary, 27th anniversary. And yeah. And so that marriage, this marriage of ours glorifies God. Uh, he was in all of the details of our marriage and coming together. And so it was a wonderful couple days. Uh, and we had this weather. We were down by Seaside, Cannon Beach. And so now you guys know, and so when some of you talk, I'm not holding out on you because I love them more, uh, you guys are in it too. So we have announcements this morning. Hope you have your bulletins because everything's pretty much in the bulletins, but I do want to point out that the women just started their new study, Daniel's Prayer, and that's on Mondays, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, so there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that. As well as on the 20th, Larry Seitz, Memorial is at Westwood Baptist Church, and we'd like to know if you plan on going, so you can let us know through the bulletin insert that you can put in the black box. We'd love for you to support the church and share your thoughts with us and questions, um, and you could also sign up and let them know that you might be attending his memorial as well. And then at entry point one, if you're interested in committing to Turning Point Church, uh, we have a membership class, and that's at entry point one and entry point two. Uh, on the 28th, we'll have another entry point one. I'll be teaching that, and that is after second service, and we have a light lunch. So let us know again on that tear-off form that you have in the bulletin and put that in one of the offering boxes. And what else? That, that, and that were the main ones. So the rest is in there for you. Uh, we're going to share city catechism now, and I'll be the leader. Since no one can keep the law, what is its purpose? That we may know the holy nature of God and the sinful nature of our hearts and thus our need of a Savior. That's exactly where you start in a conversation with someone. When you share your testimony, when you want to speak boldly about Jesus and you want to start a conversation, it's them coming to know that they are a sinner. And because they are, they will be facing the king and the judgment from the king. And in their position, they definitely need a savior. And that's the hope that lies in us. That's how we start conversations like that. And uh, God will bless you in that. Uh, grow and mature us in our faith as we share our faith with, with others. So, prayer time. You guys want to pray together? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want to pray with you. So we focus on, on God first, and that's why we have this acronym that we use. You don't have to use it perfectly. It's just a guide for us. I remember when I first became a Christian, it was ACTS. Some of you remember that, right? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. This is like that. P-R-A-Y, praise, repent, ask, and yield. So we imagine that throne room coming before him. And Father God, we, we do come before you humbled and knowing our condition and position apart from saving faith in Jesus Christ. So we praise you for that mighty work that you first called us, that you first loved us, that you are the one who grows us and matures us. You fill us with your Holy Spirit. You make possible our ability to love you. 
And we, we praise you for that. We can't take credit. You get all the glory. And we praise you and are thankful for the work that you continue to do in and through each one of us as you grow us and mature us in our faith that we can better serve you, that we can be obedient to you, that it is shown that we love you by our obedience, Lord Jesus. We are truly thankful. We are thankful that you are the God of our tomorrows, that you know all things, that we, in your presence, all of our fear is washed away, as we sang this morning, and knowing that we are always in your presence. There is no room for fear or doubt in you, Lord Jesus. We trust you with all things. And we find ourselves not trusting you. We want to be on our knees and repenting that you can lift us up, that you can bless us through the experience of growing in our faith and truly knowing that as we stand in eternity, we have nothing to fear in this world. Not wars or rumors of wars. Famine or pestilence, nothing. Take a moment knowing who God is and praise him. It is truly, truly a blessing, Lord, that we, can, that we can trust you and cling to you, knowing that you never change, that you love us perfectly. And we can just hold on to you. And knowing that when we fall short, when we need to repent, even as saved sinners, saved saints, that we fall short. There are times where we perhaps sin. We fall short of your glory and perfection. And that'll be the case till we come to you and you restore us and transform us in the flesh as well. Lord, in any way that we have been missing the mark and falling short or sinning in our, our walk with you in our life, we want to repent of that. And if there is anyone here attending today that is seeking truth and knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you open their hearts as well and reveal to them that apart from you, they are sinners and they will face you one day. The invitation will be rescinded to come to you. And so any way that we have fallen short in our thought life or, or things we're doing or some sin that has crept into our life as believers... We want to repent of that. We want to confess that to another believer that we can be healed, as Scripture says. We don't want to walk that alone. So church, let's take a moment now as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table for communion. Whatever God has brought to mind, whether it's a big thing or little things in our thought life, lack of fruit of the Spirit and being patient and kind and loving, whatever it may be, let's bring that before our Father, repent of that having a changed mind, and turning the other direction, which is to Him, always to Him. Take a moment now.
Thank you, Father, for the good news that in Christ we are forgiven into our tomorrows, and you are the God of tomorrows. You stand there preparing them for us today, the God of eternity. Thank you for forgiving us in Christ, for not holding that against us any longer, that we stand up with our face to the heavens, knowing you are a good, good Father. And we have many prayer requests this morning. We are asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is moving through the body of believers gathered here and dwelled with your Spirit, as well as those who may be attending for the first time or with family, those who have not committed to a relationship, accepted you as Lord and Savior, but they're seeking their church today. They're online listening. Open their hearts to the truth of who you are. Draw them to you, Lord. We ask that you love them first. We ask that you help us to make them good disciples, good followers, to lift them up and equip them to do your mighty work. We ask that you lift up Pastor Thomas this morning as he proclaims the truth of your word and what that looks like to live that out today. We also ask, Lord, that you continue to work in and through the church here, Turning Point Church, through the body of believers, that you're growing them and maturing them in their faith, helping all of us to become involved, to serve, and doing that out of love for you. And we ask, Lord, that today you are protecting Israel that is in front of us today. We see that. There's a war going on. And that is a spiritual hatred for you and for the Jewish people and for your church. And we ask, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just in Israel, but the Middle East and all around the world and all the nations, where you are mightily growing your church in the midst of Iran and all around the world, where persecution comes, you grow the body of believers. And you give them a faith that is strong to endure and to boldly testify and confess and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are asking that you protect them and that you bless them and that many, many, many come to you. We know that you are sovereign and you reign over the hearts and minds of kings and queens and presidents. And we are praying that you grow your church. Help us to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world. And here in America, Lord, we ask for prayer for the church, that the church turns from the culture that has been drawing them into itself, that the churches in America stand strong on your word and proclaim the truth of your word, even if it's what the culture does not want to hear. We, ha we ask, Lord, that you continue to strengthen us in that endeavor and that goal of ours to proclaim the truth here at Turning Point and to not shy away from it, to speak boldly as we ought to speak. Church, we want to uh, bring our prayer requests before the Father, family members, friends, uh, reminded to be praying for our service, men and women around the world, serving and protecting Neighbors, family members, let's take a moment now. We also ask, Lord, that you continue to bless the ministries at Turning Point, that you lift up the leaders 
we pray for the elders and deacons that you give them wisdom as they lead the church in direction. We ask, Lord, that you lift up and bless all the volunteers and leaders of ministries here at Turning Point and the ministries themselves, that they are fruitful and effective within the body of believers for each other and in the community, including our food bank, which is a great resource to the community, our care ministry that provides needs, comfort, visitation, helping hands, Continue to lift up the care ministry, Lord, as they minister to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to yield this prayer to you. We do not have to be reminded that you are sovereign, that your timing is perfect, that you know all things, that you're the God of tomorrows. We cling to that. That is our comfort. And in our prayers, it's our blessing because our timing is not perfect. We want your will to be done, so we yield these prayers to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. And the church says, amen and amen. This is a time of communion that we come together now, and this is a blessing to share this time uh, together, remembering Jesus and, and what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us as we gather together. So what we're going to do, and this is for believers and Christ followers, if you're not there yet, we just ask that you remain seated. If you're not able to get up, and that is okay, um, John will bring you the communion elements. You just raise your hand and let him know. And what we'll do is we'll rise together now and divide here in the center and come to the walls on the side and come forward and receive your elements.
This is actually a joyful moment that we come together. It can feel very somber, uh, like Good Friday, where we celebrate, and it's a bit sad. But we're remembering the sacrifice, and Jesus Christ himself established this, uh, that when we come together, we remember him. Because on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he broke it after giving thanks, and he said... This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you come together and drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you come together and eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen? Amen. Pastor Thomas. It is uh, at this time that we will release the children. Uh, so, kiddos, we have your teachers in the back there holding up signs for your classes. So if you have kids who are in the His Kids program, uh, they can go ahead and head back that way. And the rest of us, uh, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verses 15. So if you'd please grab a Bible, we have a Bible next to you on the seats, uh, or if you have your own Bible, go ahead and head there, Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 15, and we're talking about everybody's favorite topic this morning, taxes. This is your reminder, you probably need to finish those up pretty soon, <laughs> but this is one of the fun things about expository preaching. That's where you preach through a book of the Bible. Uh, you handle topics as they come, the good, the bad, the hard, the easy. So today, we are looking at a very unique encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Herodians. And if you're wondering what a Herodian is, well, buckle up. Get ready. We're going to dive into the text. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, ask that God would humble our, our hearts and our minds to receive from this word. And then I'm going to read the text aloud and we'll dive into it. Lord, we come before you now asking that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would not seek to change the text, but that we would seek to receive from your word and that we would be changed by it. And that's what I ask in the name of Jesus, that we would look at these words with eyes that are looking for truth. In a world that seems so devoid of truth, May our hearts and our minds be focused, laser-focused, on finding the truth here in your word. All of God's people said? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read it here, and then let's dive into some context. First, in verse 15, it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and left him and went away. Blessed be the reading of God's word. Amen. So where in the world does this fit in with the book of Matthew well, this is after three scathing parables that Jesus gave the religious leaders of the day. All three of those parables pointing to the simple fact that God's kingdom, who was given to the Pharisees, who was given to the Jews, the leaders who were placed there were doing a horrible job. 
they had completely forsaken the ways of God and began to follow the traditions of man. And so that kingdom would be stripped from them. They would have judgment, and God would go out and invite, if you remember the parable of the wedding feast, invite people from the roadside, as Yarrington brought up, to the wedding feast. We're talking about people who were nowhere near royalty being invited to a royal chamber for a royal party. So after these three parables where Jesus is ultimately putting the Pharisees in their place, here we have them saying, okay, we're done for a little bit. We need a breather. We've been slapped around enough. Let's send our disciples so that it seems a little bit less menacing, and we're going to try to trap Jesus in his words. And to be honest with you, this is a task that is attempted to be accomplished for 2,000 years, to try to trip Jesus up or God up in his word in the New Testament. And you have to realize that this book, the Old and the New Testament, has been the most studied book from antiquity and in antiquity, okay? We have more commentaries written on the New Testament alone than any other work from the time period. And more people who set out to disprove it or find incongruencies with the eyewitness testimonies of the First Testament than we can count, and many of them have become Christians. The notable C.S. Lewis, who was a famous atheist professor, as he was diving into the scripture to disprove the silly claims that Tolkien had made or even Lewis's own brother had made about Jesus, one day was very disgruntled meeting his brother at a pub and he, he was just recognizing the difference between the Jesus myth and all the other myths out there. And finally, his brother turned to him and said, Lewis, the problem with you is that this myth is actually true. At that moment, he got on his bike, still an atheist, and arrived at his destination, in his own words, the most reluctant convert in all of England. He'd become a Christian because he realized it all made sense. Or at least Strobel an investigative journalist who set out to disprove the Jesus story, the Jesus myth, becoming a Christian because of the overwhelming evidence for the existence of Jesus, the overwhelming evidence for the historical attestation of the New Testament, and then ultimately his life being radically transformed by Jesus, who did in fact rise from the grave. Amen? Do we believe that here, that Jesus rose from the grave? Yes. So here we are, the Pharisees and the Herodians, trying to trip Jesus up in his word. What we see in verses 15 through 17 is that you cannot hide from Jesus. You cannot hide from Jesus. Think about this. He knows everything about you. He knows your struggles. He knows your worries. He knows your triumphs. He knows what you're really good at. He knows what you say you're really good at. He knows all the things about you. And in one sense, it's absolutely terrifying. But in another sense, it's absolutely incredible because though he knows everything about you, you cannot hide from him, he still offers mercy and grace and relationship with him. That is some of the most incredible news, but you cannot hide from Jesus and neither could the Pharisees. Take a look at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Let's stop there for a moment. This is a big deal. Anytime you're reading a text from antiquity, you need to understand what's going on, the historical backdrop of the text. Because to us, who in the world are the Herodians? The Pharisees and the Herodians were polar opposites politically. Okay? The Pharisees were kind of the um, conservative religious type. They didn't like Rome at all. Uh, They wanted to have as little Roman influence upon the Jewish people as absolutely possible. The zealots, a a specific group that tried to war against Rome numerous times, rose out of this tradition. And the Herodians, well, they were from the court of Herod. Herod was placed over the Jews by Rome because he had a form of Jewish lineage. He at least knew their language and how to interact with them. And the Herodians were saying, look, let's go along to get along. We, we can make more money, we can be more successful if we simply just become a little bit more like Romans. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. You couldn't have two more polar opposite groups here who hated each other, and yet, what unified them? Jesus. 
There is no more polarizing figure in the entirety of human history than Jesus of Nazareth. We're here 2,000 years later talking about him. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, right? These two came together for the explicit purpose of trying to catch Jesus in his words. Look at what they say in verse 16. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. These two groups don't even agree on what the way of God is in the first place. How can they come together and say, we know that you teach the way of God? I mean, anybody could see right through that. And even more so, they're saying, we know that you don't judge by appearances and you don't care about people's opinions, but we hope that our seemingly high opinion of you makes you like us a bit more and give us an easier answer. They're saying, we know you're not flattered, so let us continue to flatter you. <laughs> and you have to love that this, this was the Pharisees' plan. Okay, we can't handle them, so let's send our disciples, the guys who are following us day in and day out. Let's let them get slapped around a little bit. And Jesus is going to respond masterfully. But look at the question. They set up the question, and then they ask, tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this was a loaded question. This was a question designed specifically for Jesus to either lose favor with the people or lose favor with Rome, both resulting in his death. For the Pharisaical side and for the conservative Jewish side of things, there was obviously a desire to not pay taxes. I don't know of many people who like to pay taxes in general in the first place, okay? But this was a far different situation than where we find ourselves this tax season. You see, the Jews were actively oppressed by the Roman government. They were treated as less than second-hand citizens, okay? And so on the one side, you have these people who are like, I don't want to pay money to Caesar, my oppressor. As a matter of fact, years prior to this, a man named Judas led revolts against Rome, specifically over this tax, and ensued continual violence. So you think about a whole group of people now who have relatives, some of which who perished over this issue, things get hot pretty fast. And then you have the Herodians who are saying, again, go along to get along. This was a loaded question. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Was that nice, Jesus? We have this concept in our culture of a meek and mild, weak Jesus who's not willing to call a spade a spade and be honest. He just kind of has a light voice and speaks like Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Like, like we want him to be meek and mild where Jesus, yes, he was mild. He was gentle with those who knew they needed a savior. But to those who were exploiting their own people, to those who were actively in rebellion, he shared the truth. He shared the truth in love, but he still called a spade a spade. He, in front of everybody there, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? And that's okay. That's right. It's good. There is a time and place, brothers and sisters, for us to be open and honest and to call a spade a spade. Now, where that saying comes from, I have no idea. If you know where calling a spade a spade comes from, please tell me afterwards. Jesus could have just left it. He could have just said, and because of this, I'm not going to answer your question. But he chose to give one of the most famous and masterful answers that you see in the New Testament, one of the most pithy sayings that to this day in our culture is quoted frequently by people who believe and people who do not. The answer is in the image, ultimately. Think about it. All of these people surrounding Jesus, Jerusalem is abuzz right now. I mean, he came in on a donkey. Everybody was saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Prior to this, Jesus has flipped tables, okay? He's disrupted the entire background of Jewish 
worship and civilization. And now these religious leaders are trying to trap him. And everybody's just like, you know, they're amped. They're ready for something. And here they slip him this question in hopes that he is going to make everybody mad or have Rome be upset with him. So after he calls them hypocrites, in verse 20, or sorry, verse 19, he says, Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. This was a day's wage. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? Now think about it. A day's wage back then was pretty hard to come by because you couldn't necessarily work from home unless you had a loom or a farm. And there was no air conditioning to work in. And you didn't have a water cooler to go and chat at with your office mates. It was not easy. It was all very hard labor. A day's wage was a big thing. And it gets even deeper whenever he says, whose likeness and inscription is this? One of the reasons that the Pharisees really had an issue with this tax was because on the coins themselves, you had a depiction of Caesar and ultimately a saying that attributed him to be a divine son of Augustus. So they saw this as a second command violation, ultimately uh, as a, an idolatry issue because there's an image, a graven image of Caesar, somebody that was considered to be divine on this coin. Now, however much the Romans actually believed in the divine authority of Caesar or not, you know, it's hit or miss. The Greeks tended to really believe it more than the Romans. The Romans tended to believe it whenever they needed to conquer somebody, okay? But ultimately, even on the other side, there was the Roman goddess of peace. So naturally, Jesus points out the issue, the main issue they have with this tax, the fact that Caesar is on the coin, and they naturally said, well, Caesar. And he said to them, then render, which means give back to, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Jesus did not answer the way that they wanted him to. And the primary reason, the primary thrust behind this text is not first and foremost the doctrine on how we as Christians are to relate to the government. I will say that that's not the primary thrust of this text. The primary thrust of this text is to demonstrate how Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen, how they were going to try to trip him up, and demonstrates his knowledge and ability and rulership over Caesar, and even over their questions. And we're going to get to it in a moment, the real practical side of things, because it's worth going into how we as Christians are to live under a government. But the primary issue here that Jesus is demonstrating, you're going to see all the way in Matthew chapter 23. He says this of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. That means it's a seat of teaching. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. You see, the Pharisees were so concerned about the coin and about the oppression of Rome and not concerned at all about the oppression that they were placing upon their own people. Jesus will call them out later saying, you have set aside the weightier commandments of the law for your silly man-made traditions. And this is why he says, woe to you, Pharisees. Look, you're, you're straining out a gnat, right? He, he's ultimately calling them out, saying, you're making this a big deal whenever you should be considering the loads that you're placing upon the people who are already oppressed by Rome, and yet you oppress them even further. You blind guides. That is the thrust of this text here in Matthew. However, it does beg the question, what does it mean to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's? Well, Jesus says, whose likeness is on the coin? Caesar. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. 
whose likeness is stamped on every single human being ever made? God's. We are made in the image of God, as it says in Genesis. Now, that does not mean that we are little gods. That's heresy, okay? We are made in the image of God. And you see evidences of this all over the place, the innate human desire to create, or the fact that YouTube was built specifically on cat videos. <laughs> How in the world does this relate? Al Mohler actually has a fantastic episode of The Briefing on this, but the the innate uh, joy we get from watching animals play. Think about that. From watching nature do what it does. Yarrington talks about his cats all the time. Sometimes they say, please stop. <laughs> but to watch them play, right? There's something just innately joyful about it. Or to go hiking. I mean, we live in one of the beautiful, like one of the most beautiful places in the nation. You hike, you get up on that horizon, you see the mountains, and you're awestruck. We're made in God's image. So this puny, stupid little coin with Caesar's face on it, compared to the entirety of your life, your desire, and as a matter of fact, the way in which you give to God what is God's will direct the way you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus is not discounting government or Christians' interaction with it. He's merely continuing the teaching that was given to the Israelites whenever they were in Babylonian captivity. Plant gardens, have children, seek the welfare of the land, pray for your leaders. Now the question for our modern day is how in the world do we give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's as Americans in the United States? How do we how do we live under this government? This government that initially started out, a little bit of a history lesson, the first pilgrims were Puritans. They weren't escaping for religious liberty so much as they were wanting to come and set up a Christian society. All of their little towns and cities were centered around this idea of having just weights and measures. There was an idea of a separation of church and state, but mostly to protect the church from the state. And so you, you have this historical backdrop, and you see some of those things being pulled into the Constitution and the Constitutional Republic, okay? And yes, several of the founding fathers were deists, but still a Christian worldview with just weights and measures was in play. Most notably, this idea that human beings do not receive rights from the government. Human beings have unalienable rights received from God. And so we have a nation that was built upon some of these foundational principles that has strayed greatly from those principles to the point to where in our day and age, our leaders and elected officials are arguing about whether or not human life is valuable when it is valuable and when we can terminate human life, even a child in the womb. I know this is a hard teaching, but it must be said those who are elected to protect life don't even agree on when it begins for the sake of political power. We live in a land right now where so many of these principles have been done away with. And we can feel like Christians as we're like, what's going on? What's happening to the nation? How in the world can we live in a land where there's so much disparity, and we don't even know the value and dignity of a child in the womb. The same way that our brothers and sisters can live in Iran. The same way that our brothers and sisters live in Afghanistan, China, India, whatever form of government, we can live under this government the same way that the church, the bride of Christ, has existed under every government for the past 2,000 years. And the bride of Christ has continued to grow and to be strong. It's not the end of the world yet. We need to recognize that America is not an island, and the church in America is not the only church. This is not the only form of government the church has existed under. And Christ's kingdom is without end. 
ultimately, Christ alone is king. Jesus Christ is over Caesar. He's over Joseph Biden. He's over Justin Trudeau. Jesus Christ is over every political leader on the face of the planet right now. And in one sense, that can be a little bit concerning because, well, hold on a second. There are a lot of wicked leaders. Romans 13, 5 through 7, demonstrates that these governments do not bear the sword in vain. The initial job of the government is to protect the people and bring justice between good and evil. But there are times in the Old Testament where you see God raise up bad leaders as judgment upon the land. Simply put, John Calvin says it in a sentence, whenever God judges a nation, he raises up bad leaders. So how do we live here? How do we give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's what is God's? It starts first with us recognizing we are all made in the image of God regardless of where we come from, regardless of whatever government we're under, regardless of socioeconomic status, we are made in God's image and our entire life is required. Much more than a, a silly little coin. The second thing is, is, I think the London Baptist Confession puts it really well. Quoting from Romans 13, 5 through 7, 1 Peter 2, 17, and 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, it says this, Civil magistrates being set up by God for the ends aforesaid. That means the ends of exacting justice. Subjection in all lawful things commanded by them ought to be yielded by us in the Lord, not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. And we ought to make supplications and prayers for kings and all that are in authority, that under them we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. To give to God what is God's here in the way that we interact with Caesar is simple. We strive to live quiet lives where we obey the civil authorities as much as we are not commanded to do something that goes against the law of Christ. The moment we are commanded to do something that goes against the law of Christ, we boldly refuse and we say no. And we continue to do what we're commanded to do. Churches around the world are doing this, meeting in homes, meeting underground, being persecuted, being thrown in jail. But that does not mean that we do not seek the welfare of our nation. You and I have been placed here for a purpose. We have been given so much more freedom than we, we understand and I hear so many Christians right now who are so angry and worried and upset and concerned because they continue to watch the news. And there's this lack of hope because everything's on fire and everything's terrible. Where's your hope, Christian? Who's your king? Is your king the United States government? No, your king is Jesus Christ. He rose from the grave. He's the only one who's defeated death. He's your hope. Don't be dismayed. This is what happens in human history. We've never had a utopia. But there is a king. And he will set his kingdom. And it will last forever. And it will be perfect. So give to God what is God's. Do honor and worship. And give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Seek the welfare of the land you live in. As it says in the Old Testament, plant gardens, have children. Seek to influence the people around you, the neighbors, the cities, the towns, the nation, for the sake of the gospel. It's that simple. Don't grumble and complain and be a grouch all the time. Do something about it. We live in a place now where we have the ability to vote. We have the ability to meet. We have the ability to go out and to donate finances and time to worthy causes. So that whenever we say we do affirm the sanctity of human life, we actually mean it from womb to tomb, everywhere in between. The church in America needs to wake up. We really can bless this nation. So, TPC family, Jesus is King of Kings. Worship Him. Now, worship is a Christian buzzword. We think of worship music, right? 
Worship is literally, as it says in Romans 12, it's a submission of your mind. It's a transforming and a renewing of your mind. That means I was thinking one thing today, but now I'm thinking another thing, and I'm going this way, and I'm understanding God's will. Worship is a position of your life. So whenever I say Jesus is king of kings, I do mean he's king above every single kingdom, and I'm going to worship him by the way I treat the civil magistrate, and by the way I treat my neighbor, by the way I treat my spouse, by the way I treat my family and my children, and especially by the way I treat my enemies. Those who I might believe are destroying the nation, and maybe they actually are. Your allegiance is to Christ first. Jesus is king of kings. Worship him. We get so concerned about these small, minute things, and they seem big right now, but in the light of eternity, brothers and sisters, it's only a coin compared to the vast riches of the grace and the glory of Christ in eternity. I was speaking with somebody in between service about this. It's similar to whenever Paul is getting on to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. He's, I mean, he's laying into him. He's like, are you guys really taking each other to court? Seriously? Like, you're taking your brother and sister in Christ before a Roman court? You can't just settle this? Why not just be wronged? Like, get over yourself. Just be wronged. Forgive and move on. Yeah, to give to God what is God's and to give to Caesar what is Caesar, it's always going to require sacrifice. That's just the way it is. But that is the way of the Christian. To be sacrificial. Because our Lord is sacrificial. So, the, the final thing that I really want you to know is the fact that Jesus is King of Kings, that means that no politician, no tax break, no regime, no nation... No army can save you from death. Every single one of us will die. Every single one of us. Whether it's by the hands of the government or whether it's by something ridiculous, okay? I trip and fall while I'm trying to clean out my car. I don't know. Yarrington and I were just talking about that this morning. Going around that roundabout could be your last time, okay? <laughs> but it could. None of these things can save us from death. Not even us receiving a politician or a party in leadership that we want. They can't save you from death either. Only Jesus Christ can. And we should be a strange people who look at all of these things going on and we can with a strange hope say, yeah, I'm going to continue to bless my neighbor and those around me. I'm going to share the gospel boldly. And no matter what happens, I'm going to vote the way I think I should vote in accordance with the scripture. But you know what? Even if my nation does fall apart, do you know which one won't? The kingdom of Christ. So, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Christ is king of kings. Worship him and have hope. Money always runs out. Movements always peter away. Hope in Christ is never destroyed because that transcends death. They cannot take your hope from you. So what we're going to do as we close out is we're going to do what that passage says. We're going to pray specifically for our elected officials for our nation, and for the church in America that we together could sacrificially share the good news of Christ. For those of you who have never heard that good news, knowing that to be a sinner means that you have walked away from the Lord. It's an archery term before it's a religious one. It's going to the wrong place. And God is just, and if he's just, we all stand condemned doing more wrong than good. But to show his grace, he sent his son to pay the penalty for that wrong, to die with it, to be buried, and to physically raise from the grave. Yes, this is a historical fact. We have attestation of the resurrection of Jesus and the belief of his disciples and those who didn't like him. So that if I call on him, 
I can have life right now. We're going to pray to that king. And I will say this. If you have any questions about any of the things I said here today, we are more than open to questions. I can't promise you I have all the answers, nor can I promise you you will like my answers. I can promise you I won't talk to you like I'm preaching right now. (laughs) I want to hear your questions. Let's go to God in prayer. And let's pray for these things. Lord, it says in your word that you desire that we would all lift up holy hands, that we would pray for those who are officials over us, for the government that we find ourselves in. So, Lord, we pray for Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris, that they would come to know and follow you, and that you would give them wisdom as they do not bear the sword in vain. We pray for Governor Jay Inslee and for the predecessor, whoever that may be, that he would come to know you as Lord and Savior and follow you and receive wisdom as he does not bear the sword in vain. We pray for the church in America and for ourselves right now because even those names can evoke a level of anger for some of us. I pray that you, Lord, would humble us recognizing that every single one of us is in need of a Savior, past, present, and future. And that we would seek the welfare of our nation, of the people who live next door to us. We pray, God, for a revival in America, but one that looks like massive repentance, that we would take sin seriously that we would take grace seriously. And I pray that you'd help us to not be so grumpy about the days and times. If anything, may we look to our brothers and sisters in India right now who for the faith in Jesus are being martyred and killed. May we look to our brothers and sisters in Iran where we have the fastest growing church in the world under massive persecution. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen them and give them boldness and show us how we can love them well, our brothers and sisters. We ask that you would give us an eternal and a worldwide perspective on these things. Humble us, Lord. We need you now more than ever. Well, I would say more than ever. We've always needed you. And we will always need you. And one day, one day you are coming again in the clouds and in glory. One day, that royal scepter, you will command all things to be made new. And we will be with you with unfettered access before the throne of God, singing your praises for eternity, enjoying what enjoyment actually is. Because you are king of kings and Lord of lords, and we are your people, and you are our God. We worship you. Give us wisdom to bless our communities and where we live in these strange days. And Lord, lastly, whenever the day may come where we are asked to do things that we know are not in accordance with Scripture, May you give us boldness to stand firm on the truth, unapologetically, because we know that your will is better. May we not follow the ways of man, but the ways of God. Strengthen your church. For whenever that time comes again, or whenever that time comes, we love you and we trust you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, by the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Uh, taxes and politics, huh? Religion and politics, too. We got a whole bunch this morning. Well, please stand as we say this together. And say this with me. Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Brothers and sisters, are you made in the image of God? 
Have you been redeemed by Christ to redeem everything around you? So go, redeem all things you lay your hands on, and spread the gospel of Jesus. And we will see you next week. We love you here at Turning Point.